All right, grab your Bibles, Hebrews 13. We're doing it, y'all. We're really doing it. We're finishing. Can you believe it? Today, uh, we finish our 14th book of the Bible we've gone through in eight years as a church. So, only 52 more to go as a church after this. We're doing it. Uh, Well, last week, after so many chapters of just seeing how superior Jesus is, we got some kind of rapid-fire calls to practical action, and it showed us uh, this important reality that truth without transformation is worthless, right? Uh, Heart change must produce habit change, right? At the end of the day, if we really understand who Jesus is in Hebrews 1 through 12, then we'll live differently. We'll live like Hebrews 13, right? When, when his supreme worth actually gets a hold of us, it transforms us into a life that pleases God. Now, lest we take all that and run away from this book with hollow kind of New Year's resolutions style determination, the final word today is going to steer us in the right direction. It, it's not only going to encapsulate everything we've heard, but it's going to help us now with a critical last puzzle piece to apply it. Okay, well, part of my role as uh, one of your pastors is I pay attention to what's happening around us in culture. You guys know how much of a culture savant I am. I'm here to keep you up to speed on the latest trends. I take this job very, very seriously. And so I want to introduce you today to a new word that's made its way into 2024 Lingo, okay? Seeing it pop up everywhere. And it's not drip. It's not bussin'. I know, I know you guys use these words. It's not vibe check or manifest or anything like that. None of these. 1,700 new words that just got added to the dictionary last week. The word of 2024 so far, let me just tell you, okay? It's solar, right? You're like, yeah, okay, okay. Solar everything now. Think about it. Solar panels, solar Farms, solar wind, solar obviously eclipse, right? Big rays a few weeks ago. You can buy solar lamps. You can buy solar glasses, solar generators, solar cars. Don't forget solar storms with solar flares. They give solar radiation, right? Solar is everywhere. If you want to call someone solar, actually do it. It's a compliment, right? It just means someone's radiant, bright, distinguished, okay? Oh, very good. I call it the comeback adjective of the year. Solar is the new matcha. It's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. Even got solar donkeys. Check it out. (laughs) Here we go. New Ford Foal coming at you right there. Just put solar in front of anything and it works. You want some solar fries with solar sauce? Yeah, that sounds good, right? Uh, Who wouldn't want to wear solar shoes? Maybe sit in a solar chair. Uh, You could tell someone that was a solar presentation. Solar is just so hot right now. There you go. You're welcome. All right. In all seriousness, uh, I have been thinking a lot about the sun lately. Uh, That's not a Jesus joke, okay? Like the actual sun. The sun warms, obviously warms our planet. It powers our weather. It moves the waves and the currents in our ocean. Life on earth simply fails without the sun. It feeds every living thing. Think, plants live by the sun, right? And the longer they're in the sun, the more what nutrient dense they become. Animals eat plants that, so essentially they're living off things that live by the sun. Humans that eat plants or eat animals live off things that live by the sun. No matter how you slice it, right, the original source of every ounce of energy we use is the sun. Not just every bit of food. Think about every bit of fuel. Fossil fuels were once what? Plants who got their energy from the sun. Uh, Wind, hydroelectric, what's driving that? Ultimately, it is the sun, no matter where you turn, it's the sun. Did you know more Energy, we get more energy from the sun in a single hour than what we need to power our entire planet's devices for a year. That's power right there. Do you know how vastly your health is improved simply by being in the sun? Not just vitamin D, not just your mood, 
Uh, it's not just energy, which it is. You stand out in the sun, right? It just feels energizing, but it reduces inflammation. It boosts your immunity. You get better sleep. It helps you battle depression. There are actual, literal, medical treatments, sunlight therapy, that have been proven to prevent and cure diseases. That is power. It is not shocking to me that everything revolves around it. Which, by the way, was only discovered less than 500 years ago, right? Copernicus and kind of uh, re-centralizing uh, everything because up until then, everything was what? Us-centered, earth-centered. And now we, we know what? It's the solar system. Well, Hebrews has been doing a similar kind of re-centering over the last 13 chapters. And today it ends by highlighting the full extent of this power source that is at the center of everything. Now it's time for the Jesus as the sun joke right there. Okay, so here we go. Hebrews 13, verse 20. We're going to see the authors wrapping it up today with kind of a final benediction, a final blessing for his readers. And it's not a skip over passage, okay? There is a central diamond-like truth that we have to grasp about the gospel today. If we don't, if we miss this, then there's going to be a major pitfall in our Christian life. We won't be able to apply not only Hebrews, but any book of the Bible rightly. So here we go, verse 20. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. So this is a prayer, right? And he begins his prayer not with petition, but with praise, okay? He's going to ask God for some things in a minute, but first he starts with just reiterating who God God is, which is how we should pray too, right? And he gives four descriptions, and these descriptions are not random, they're not flowery phrases, they're specific, and they're purposeful. We're going to see four things that we have in God, and then we're going to see two things that God does for us, and then we're going to end with one thing for us in response. So let's look at the first description, the God of peace. What a wonderful phrase for God, the God who First of all, has peace, the source of everything that is under the umbrella of peace. Uh, we know the word in the Hebrew is shalom, right? Which is not just a word of the avoidance of conflict, the lack of conflict, but it, it's a word of wholeness, of fullness. It's the absolute robust presence of everything that is good, where nothing is fragmented, nothing is broken or divided or weak. Everything is together and it's in order. So there's harmony, and there's unity, and there's stability. In other words, there's rest. That's what existed in, in Eden in Genesis 1 and 2, and it's what will exist in the new heavens when Jesus returns, right? It is what every human spends their life chasing, this type of peace. And true peace is only found in God. He contains peace. Now, take it a little deeper. He contains peace because he himself is at peace. Peace. Our triune God is never restless, y'all. Never anxious, never internally in conflict. He's never scrambling or flustered. Like, think about so many of, of our parents, so many of us even, right? This is how we live with this kind of low grade agitation, um, low grade anxiety. We're fearful. Maybe on the inside, we're kind of torn with tension and unrest all the time, but not our perfect. Father, he is like an endless glass ocean of calm. <laughs> never stressed, never uncertain, just full of relaxed security. Man. This is why when you're in the presence of God, there's always peace. He's full of peace. He is himself at peace. Now check this. He gives us his peace. John 14, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. We, we hit the jackpot because he lets us into this kind of peace. And, th and that's exactly what these Hebrews in the middle of their suffering needed. It's exactly what we need as life's waters get choppy, right? And, and our boat's getting slammed with storms and everything around us feels uh, uh, nothing, it, 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 nothing at all like it's calm. The Lord is able to kind of give us a fresh supply of his anxiety overriding peace, the kind of peace that swallows up fear and 
quiets the chaos. If you know the Lord, then you've experienced this before, this peace that silences your insecurity, right? There's this limitless stillness for your soul. I, I, I just love, what a wonderful picture of God to leave these Hebrews with. Uh, this is why Philippians ends with a God of peace, Thessalonians ends with a God of peace, Romans ends with a God of peace. It's a fitting way to leave people focused on this aspect of God. Now, he has peace, he is at, at peace, he gives peace, but that peace isn't for everyone, okay? Not everyone gets the God of peace. It's only for those who are at peace with God, because God, we know, is the, also the God of justice. He's the righteous judge of sin, and the remarkable reality of the gospel is that through Jesus absorbing the wrath and the punishment of sin that we deserve, we are now what? Made that, that relationship with God that is broken. We are now what? Reconciled to him. We're now at peace. Look at Romans 5. Since we've been justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through Jesus. Ephesians 2. You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Christ himself it says, is our peace. He's reconciled us to God. So peace isn't just a state of being. It's a relationship status with God. That's what salvation is. Us and God are now good again. We're at peace because sin has been forgiven. So for those who have trusted Jesus, we have, look at this, a saving reconciliation with God and then we have a saving restoration from God. That's what peace is. It is both. How reassuring today. Is this not what we need? And God has it. Okay, look at number two. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Okay, not only do we have the God of peace, we've got the risen Lord, y'all, this is what Hebrews has been unpacking for a long time. What makes Jesus superior to all others? What makes him the great high priest? Do you remember this? Chapter 7 is that he's alive. <laughs> the power of an indestructible life. He's not dead. He rose again. He ripped through the veil and took us into the holy of holies with him. This is crazy, right? <laughs> Like the sovereign creator who's full of majesty, so mighty, who we could not approach him on our own as sinful beings. Now through Jesus, we have free access to him. This is astonishing, right? Do you remember this in chapter 7? And, and not only that, but the fact that he's not dead means, go back to 725, it means that he always lives to make intercession. Y'all remember this? Like J Jesus isn't tapping out. He's not um, hitting the clock and turning off. He's not asleep. He is alive. He's right now at the right hand of God in the throne room, and he's doing what? Interceding for you. Constantly applying the cross to what you and I need right now. And so it says, consequently, he's able to save us, what? To the uttermost. <laughs> he's able to get us to the finish line of heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Just as he's risen from the dead, our now concrete hope is that we will too, because the pioneer of our salvation has power over death, y'all. And when he returns, every one of his enemies, sin, Satan, death, will get trampled for good under his feet. Like you talk about for these Hebrews, confirmation, validation, right? In the face of suffering, we have a risen Lord. So let's remember, Jesus isn't just merely one of a thousand priests in the line of Aaron, right? He's not just a prophet on par with Moses and Abraham. He's not just a king like Melchizedek or David. You remember this? No, no, no. Jesus is far greater than those. He's the prophet and the king and the priest of a different kind. He's unrivaled, un parallel. Did you catch the word he uses right here? He is unmistakably Lord. Let's go back to chapter one for a moment. How did this whole thing start? Jesus, the heir of all things, 
through whom the world was created. He is the radiance, solar, right, of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus upholds the universe by his very word. That is power, y'all. He's far superior to any other human, far superior even to angels. And for 12 chapters, we've been getting that tour of the supremacy of Jesus, have we not? Only here now, finally at the very end, for the author to unveil a word he has not used the whole book. It's as if he's crescendoed all up to this very point. And the word in Greek is in the chief position in the sentence. He's spotlighting it. Here's the capstone. I've been arguing for 12 chapters. Let me say it plainly. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. He's king. He's first place. He has authority over all. Satisfaction better than all. His praise is worthy of all. He is Lord of all. Is this not what we need? Jesus is this. Now, number three, his path of lordship was not without pain. Look at the last phrase in the verse. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. Now, how did he bring him from the dead? By the blood of the eternal covenant. Okay. Now, he's reminding us of the central part of the book. Chapters 8, 9, 10, where Jesus ushers in a new and better covenant, a new relationship with God. Remember, the the old one failed. Why? Because it was built on us and we fail, but not the new one. Now we have an unconditional, one-way, unilateral, unbreakable relationship. We're, we're bound now to this God of peace, not just for a few hours until we screw it up, not just for a few weeks, but for forever. Remember chapter 9, verse 12, he secured an eternal redemption. And how? By the means of his own blood. Right? How, how did he secure us, this God of peace? How, how did he overcome death? And the answer is... Through death. You remember this? <laughs> yeah, there was a cross before a resurrection. And chapter 2 helps us remember this that the one who created everything, who is Lord of all, what came as one of us, suffered like each of us, and tasted death for all of us. God, this is what's so stunning about Jesus, what just stops you in your tracks when you actually think about it, that he was, remember chapter 2, 9 and 10, he was perfected through suffering so that we have a merciful and faithful and sympathetic high priest. And it was through death, through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. How else could our sin be paid for? How else could you be for given and cleansed of your guilty conscience. Our great high priest had to climb up on the altar and become our once and for all sacrifice. It's almost unfathomable, isn't it? Like that kind of love. We have a suffering Savior. And so this phrase here, this blood-bought eternal covenant means that your salvation is secure. Sealed, guaranteed, is this not what we need? (laughs) Yeah, and God's done it. Praise number four. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus by the blood of the eternal covenant, the great shepherd of the sheep. The suffering Savior, this risen Lord, is now what our, our shepherd. He's the good shepherd of John 10 who lays down his life willingly for the sheep so that we might have life and have it abundantly. He's the chief shepherd of 1 Peter 5 and Hebrews 13 last week, the true pastor to follow who's joyfully and sleeplessly keeping watch over our souls with perfect tender care. 
He's the shepherd of Revelation 7, did you read it this week, who guides us to living water and who will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Jesus is the fulfillment, oh yeah, even of Psalm 23, the one, the shepherd who, what, who is before us, leading us to still waters and green pastures who's beside us in the valley of the shadow of death with reassuring comfort and who's behind us, whose goodness and mercy is smoothing over our suffering and our sin. This is Jesus. As Hebrews ends, he's moving from great high priest to great shepherd, from lamb to Lord. And he leaves us with that picture. He is your caring, compassionate, providing and protecting, always leading, always interceding, and never leaving shepherd who will keep you safe. Is this not what you need? (laughs) Yes. And Jesus is it. And so we come to verse 21. Four things we just saw God is for us. Now, two things God does for us. May this God, verse 21, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Equip, katartizo in the Greek, to make complete, make strong, fit for a purpose. There's really two angles to this word. The first is to supply what is lacking. This is a term of provision, of resources, okay? Uh, It's kind of how we use it in English, right? The kitchen came fully equipped, or the soldiers were equipped for battle. Think of a supplier or an outfitter. Uh, In Zion National Park last year when we were there, we were uh, on the shuttle bus coming home from a hike and we saw this family across, started talking to them, and they were shivering. Uh, Like they were pale. Uh, I was concerned for them, honestly. They were freezing and it was 90 degrees and sunny outside. See, what had happened is they had hiked the narrows, the narrows is this narrow chute where the snow melt water kind of forms in the canyon and comes out. And in order to hike the narrows, you have to be equipped. <laughs> you have to have waterproof boots and waders because you're wading through waste and sometimes higher, deep, just frigid water. And they didn't. They were in tennis shoes. And hours later, here they are, like on the verge of like, they need medical help because they weren't equipped. They lacked the right supplies. Equip means to supply what is lacking, but it also means to restore what's broken, to join together and make something whole. Uh, It's used medically to set a broken or dislocated bone. In sailing, it's to repair a broken ship. In fishing, it's to mend broken nets. It's the idea of setting right what has gone wrong putting it back in its appropriate condition so it will function well. It's a word of restoration. So, put those two together. God's giving us everything we need by, by, what? by supplying what we're lacking and by restoring in us what is broken, right? Helping plus healing. Preparing plus repairing. He is doing both. And catch this definition of cathartizo, to make us what we ought to be. I love that. He's equipping you, making you what you ought to be. This is the same word in Luke 6, 40, where Jesus says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but when he is fully trained, there it is, cathartizo, he will be like his teacher. So you and I are following Jesus and are being sanctified. We're being made like our master. We're being trained. We're being equipped. And so enabled to obey. Because notice the rest of the sentence. Equipping's for a purpose, to get the job done. You might have everything good, everything you need to make you fit, to make you ready to see what it says. To what? To do his will. Aha! Uh-huh. You were saved for a life of purpose of flourishing faith in action. Like think of all the exhortations in Hebrews, right? Hold fast to Jesus. Don't drift in complacency. Draw near in prayer. Run your race with endurance, hupomane. 
Throw off entangling sin. Lay aside unnecessary distractions. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen, he's equipped you for all of this. All of it. All those practical calls to action in the life, in the last chapter, to love others and show hospitality and honor marriage and the sacredness of sex and care for those who are hurting and follow leaders, all of those things. How can I possibly do that? Like, I don't have what it takes to do this on my own. I don't have the tools in and of myself. I see my inability. And in here, the book ends to rush in and God say, I will equip you. I'm your supplier. Y'all, y'all know, think back to 2020, right? The, the supply chain breakdowns <laughs> in a COVID world, right? Where literally it took nine months to get a microwave and you'd go buy a car and there'd be one on the lot, right? You, y'all remember the toilet paper shortage? Yeah, like who could forget that, right? As great as our global economy is, it, it's susceptible to breakdowns. Oh, but not our God. His supply is unfailing. You have every resource at your disposal, a full arsenal. Listen, listen. You can do this. <laughs> Through him, you have what it takes to actually carry these things out, right? How encouraging. Because listen, I know some of you are, maybe you're in, in reading Hebrews, you're going, I, I can't do this. I'm weak. I'm not good at this. I'm not a super mature Christian. I don't, I don't feel like I have a lot of spiritual gifts. I don't have a track record of success. If I'm honest, I feel like a, a B-team Christian. Maybe a C-team Christian. Huh. I'm too inadequate. Or maybe in reading Hebrews, you've just been confronted with your failure. Like I am that person who's been complacent, where I've seen my compromises, and, I, and I, I'm, I've been filled with shame and guilt. Like how can God use me? I've blown it a lot. Or maybe just even all the hard things that you've walked through, you're just beat down and beat up. And like, I've just gone through too much. I'm too banged up and broken. You feel discouraged and defeated. And you're thinking, I'm, I'm too deficient and I'm too damaged. And the Lord today is saying loud and clear, listen, nothing's too deficient for my sufficiency. Nothing's too ruined for my restoration. I will supply you with what is lacking and I will mend what is broken. I will equip you. I'm your shepherd and you have all that you need. Think about that. Every spiritual resource is yours. Like you, you have Jesus who saved you. You have Jesus who's now shepherding you, but, but you, you have his word. You have access to him in prayer. You have, a, you have the church, <laughs> leaders who are teaching you, community to encourage you. For crying out loud, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. <laughs> Grace upon grace upon grace, it is like a robust buffet, man. Not like those bad buffets, not like Luby's or Golden Corral, like the best of the best, like Texas Day Brazil, man. Give me some fillets on swords, just keep the meat coming. Like that's what we have in God is an endless feast. The table is set. Now, someone might say, okay, yeah, but you got to put those resources to use. You got to wield those weapons. You got to cook that meal. Still depends on you to make it happen. And to that, the writer adds the next game changing phrase. Look at it working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. What a phrase. God's not only the supplier, he is the applier also. He's not only equipping you, he's somehow mysteriously accomplishing the very things that he's calling you to do. (laughs) Right? 
All those commands we saw last week, God's inside you producing those things in you. It says he's working in us, poieo, to do in the Greek. The very word that you just saw in the last phrase, that we might do his will. So he's doing the doing. (laughs) In other words, you're not left to do it alone. God doesn't throw you in the room with all the tools and say, figure it out. No, no, no. Like a good father, he comes around you. He places his hands on you. And he does it through you. Working it deep in you like a potter kneading the clay. Forming and fashioning you into the very vessel he wants to use. Now, if this is still a little out there of a concept, you're like, help me understand this better, we're going to jump to Philippians 2 because it will help us understand it better. Look at verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, well, hold up. That's us doing the work. Yep. Look at the rest of the sentence. For it is God who works in you both to will and and to work for his good pleasure. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Same concept, God working in us to be able to obey and please him. Now, notice two key things that he's working, both to will and to work. Number one, to will, uh, your desire, your motivation, your heart posture to want to do this, right? To see that clinging to Jesus is good and obeying Jesus is good. It's better. It's worth it. I want to do this. I want God. I want to do what he says. It is not an obligation or a duty. It's a delight. Your heart and your head are getting synced up with him. But so too are your hands and your habits, both to will and to what? To work, man. The strength that it takes the power, the effort, the word here, energeo, <laughs> energy. Now listen, we, we know we're not robots, right? We don't, we don't simply get mature by sitting on a spiritual couch and doing nothing. It takes action. There's spiritual and emotional and mental and, yes, physical effort involved on our part, 100%. But guess what? God's the one energizing it all. He, he works in you, same word, energeo. He's energizing your energy. This is exactly what Colossians 1.29 says. Look at this. For this I toil, I work, striving with all what? What does it say? My energy? His energy. Yeah, you got this. This is English. You got it. His energy. It's him in you. It's not only his energy, but what? His energy that he's powerfully working with in me, right? Like he's not only the supplier, he's not the power source, the energy drink in you, but he's actually accomplishing it inside you. Okay, well, what's our role then? Well, notice how Philippians frames it. Go back to Philippians 2. Work out what God is working in. There's our role. Work out what God's working in. Join God in this work he's doing inside you surrender. Let him sync up with what he is doing and capitalize on all this potential energy to convert it into kinetic energy. Is that right, science people? Did I do that right? Okay. A couple head nods. Great. All right. All of this. Think about all that's stored inside of you, right? Uh, Let's just use this workout analogy for a moment. God's equipped you. He's given you a, a body. He's equipped you with the gym, so to speak. He's provided you his hands-on training. He's deposited in you all the nutrients, all the stored explosive energy inside of you that's pumping and surging through you that has you wanting and itching to move. And he's even stirred in you the motivation, the desire to do this. All you got to do now is put in the spiritual sweat. Just act on that energy. So we can say it this way, God's working in you the willpower and the work ethic to work out, okay? How amazing is that? 
Look at Ezekiel 36. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I'll, I'll write it on your heart. I'll work this into you. Now, y'all, don't miss the staggering implication of all of this today. What are we getting at? In order to please God, you need God. It's, it's kind of the opposite of raising kids. Okay, raising kids, the goal is what? Independence, right? Like we're, we're progressively moving to where they don't need me anymore. That's success as a parent, right? So uh, we celebrate walking by yourself, eating by yourself, showering by yourself, a lot of other things by yourself. We won't say from up here, right? And these are milestones. We're like, yes, you're doing it without me, right? And one day we'll launch them into the world and we've trained them and hopefully formed their character and their critical thinking and their love for Jesus that they can actually function now on their own. That's what adulthood is. But spiritually, it's the opposite. Maturity is an increasing recognition of our ongoing need for God. And thus, there's an ever closer communion. There's quicker reflexes to run to Him, and there's a moment by moment asking and abiding. Like John 15, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. This, what we're seeing today, is the death of your self-reliance. It is, catch this, a discipleship of dependence. God's discipling in you how to depend on him, right? Galatians 3 kind of exposes this foolish mindset in the Galatians where they were trying to be perfected, verse 3, by the flesh. They're trying to be equipped on their own strength. Verse 4, he's like, has your suffering not taught you, verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you work miracles among you by your own ability, by your works of the law? Like, no, don't go back to that old independent thinking, like, I got this now. Like, God saved me by grace, but now it's up to me. He's passed the baton. He's like, that's foolish. Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. So you and I, listen, we need far greater far more constant, far more energizing help than we possibly understand. And so he ends the book where they could have, he could have flung the Hebrews out into an anxious toil, spinning their wheels, trying to do all this on their own, and he quiets them down, saying, hey, the God of peace, oh, he's working this in you. He's pumping this energy into you. Stay tethered to him like a channel, like an open channel for his water to flow through. He'll do it. And since he's doing it, he gets the glory. Look at the phrase in verse 21, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our our obedience, this free and joyful, energizing, saying yes to God and practical action becomes so natural, so organic in us that we actually can't take any credit for it. Does a garden boast of its own bounty? Can we boast of our own growth? Uh, It always strikes me, you know, how like we we tell kids like, uh, you've grown so much. We got a growth chart and like even like at student camp, send off on Wednesday. I was telling a student, I was like, oh my gosh, you have shot up. I can't believe it, right? And, and at first, like, if you've ever paid attention, kids are like, they're confused. They're like, well, what else would I do, right? <laughs> I'm just growing. And then they started, oh, well, yeah, like, I am doing, I am tall, aren't I? Yeah, I, I did eat over the last four years. Yeah, exactly. It's so funny, like we take credit for this. Like you can't take credit for growing, right? Like you just showed up and ate. That's all you did. Who gets the glory for our growth? We put the food in and then this unstoppable internal process takes over. We didn't supply those nutrients, right? And we didn't even apply those nutrients. The Lord gets the glory. And so this eliminates, does it not, any rationale for pride? Any puffing of our chest? Like the mature Christian is growing in 
awareness of grace. Gratitude for mercy. Where if I have anything that is good in me, anything wise, anything that's worthwhile, it's because God has formed it in me. For from him and through him and to him alone are all things, right? Now, all that can be said is true, and yet verse 23 can still be said to close. Verse 22, sorry. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. I don't know about briefly, <laughs> right? I mean, did you guys see that this week? Uh, 4,953 words. It's a little dense, okay? But don't get lost in the details. The overarching message of Hebrews is quite straightforward. As you're suffering, don't get sucked in to complacency trying to hold on to the ease and the comforts and the treasures of this world. No, no, no. Keep enduring by fixing your eyes on Jesus. He is unquestionably better. That's the message of Hebrews, right? And then for chapter after chapter after chapter, he teaches, he expounds on why Jesus is better. He gives us every, every, or every angle to that, right? You want hope? Jesus is your better hope. You want rest? Oh, he's better than that too. Everything you're looking for, he is the ultimate source of. He is better. There's tons of teaching. But did you see this? He's actually saying that it's an exhortation. It's an appeal. It's a sermon. It is preaching. (laughs) He's appealing to us to do something with this truth. Take it and hold fast. Don't quit. Draw near. Throw off that entangling sin. Lay aside those distractions. Fix your eyes on him. Let discipline train you. Don't stop gathering together, but devote yourselves to brotherly love and on and on. He has passionately preached to them so that what? Y'all, work out what God's working in. That's the whole, that's what he's saying. That's his appeal. And so we need to heed these words too. And he finishes the book kind of some personal greetings, Timothy saying some things in verse 23 through 24 and ends in verse 25, grace be with you all. Because in order to apply this word, again, he's tethering it back, you need the grace of God. You need the grace of a God of peace. You need the grace of a risen Lord. You need the grace of an eternal covenant. You need the grace of a shepherd. And guess what? You have it. (laughs) You have all that you need. Let's, let's go back through this list. As we start applying this word, I want, I want to help you see some profound things on each of those. Like, let's just start asking, like, what's chaotic in your life right now? What's confusing or full of conflict? What's fractured or distracted or not whole? Where are you anxious today? Afraid? Stressed? Where do you need rest? You have the God of peace. What's dead and dormant in your world? What feels hopeless or lifeless or defeated? What's flat and failing? What lacks purpose and power? Listen, you have the conqueror over the grave. You have the one who makes beauty out of ashes, who breathes life into dry bones, the creator of the universe who has all authority in heaven and on earth to make things new. You have the risen Lord. What's uncertain around you? When you look around, what feels flimsy, temporary, shakable? Where do you feel insecure or empty today? Where do you feel rejected? Where's their guilt, their shame, or this pressure to perform? Listen, you've been set free from that and sealed with salvation once and for all. Jesus has secured a forever home for you full of unconditional love. You are in an unbreakable covenant. You have the suffering Savior. And last, where do you need protection and provision? What doesn't have direction in your life or leadership in your life or care in your life? Where are you wounded and hurting? Misunderstood 
alone? Where do you feel threatened or tired? You have the great shepherd today. You have all you need in the presence of God. And he's now at work in you, (laughs) equipping, energizing, ensuring you have every resource you need to do his will, and then to stir you on the inside to want and to work out every ounce of that energy. Y'all, that is phenomenal news. What a way to close this book. And so I want us to end just two simple things. One, I want us to identify what has God been working in you in Hebrews, okay? Uh, we've been in it 21 weeks. Maybe this is your first week, um, and so it's just about today. But, but for those of us who have been here, like, he's been working some big-time things in us, instilling, needing, forming. Like, what, like, encapsulate that. What are the one, two, three highlights he has been like spotlighting for you through this whole book. I mean, let's be real. I know most of you don't remember Hebrews chapter 9 by now, or chapter 3. Like most of us forget the sermon a few weeks, a few days later, right? So I want us to think bigger picture. Like what, as the whole entirety of Hebrews, has he been working in you? Do not miss it. Do not go four or five months without him trying to emphasize something for you and you move on. No, no, no. We're going to seal that today. We're going to ask him to take hold of that and work it and ingrain it so deeply into us that he brands it onto our soul forever. What stuck out? Let's define that. Make it clear and concrete so that you can take all that potential energy and convert it to growth. Which means number two, prayer. Let's ask him for the help to work out what he is working in. The best way we can apply this passage today is prayer. Right? Like, what, what do you do with a God who equips and energizes? Well, you become a person of constant prayer then, right? This is what this passage does today. It is it's a prayer. And so you, you draw ever closer in communion and you ask for help. You draw near to that throne of grace. You remember chapter four? The one who has the mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. That's what we do. This is a discipleship of dependence. And so today, let's, let's just be aware of our utter need. And then let's look to the one who has our need, who loves to give us what we need. And let's go get it in prayer. May God equip you. May he work it into you. This is a prayer. Let's do the same thing. Y'all, as the band comes up and we get ready to respond, as we we think about that, let's remember this. Prayerlessness is functional atheism. Like, let's just get real with ourselves. Like, I'm talking to me here, too. When we're slacking in prayer, when our impulse is not running to the Lord for help, when we're autopilot in our life, we are shouting very silently, but very significantly, we don't need God. I got this on my own. Everything's under control. I'm cool. And God graciously wants to work that dangerous, faulty operating system out of us. <laughs> he wants us to, to take in a better oxygen, the oxygen of prayer, to breathe in and out the peace of God and the power of God and the provision of God. I have to consistently remind myself, you guys, and and so I want to remind us today, prayer's not a burden, man. Like, I think as we follow Jesus, it's so easy to go, oh, okay, yeah, like, check off my spiritual bingo card of prayer, right? It's this task. It's this obligation. I'm supposed to. No, 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 no. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Like a silly way that I like to say it to myself, prayer's not a chore for Jesus. It's a door to Jesus. It's an invitation. It's like, get in here. I got what you need. 
which is so astonishing, isn't it? I've been following Jesus 31 years and I still can't hardly believe that he wants to talk with me. <laughs> and so before we start singing, uh, we're going to do something a little different today. The band is going to play some uh, instrumental music for us for a few minutes. And the point is, I, I want you some, to have some space with God. To crystallize and identify, okay, what has God been working into me in Hebrews? Let's make that really clear. What are those one and two or three things that if I leave this book and I go about my life doing the same with no change, then I will have missed a profound message from the Lord? What is that? What's he instilling in you? And then, then let's pray. Let's ask him to seal that in us, to equip and to energize you for it. God, help me work out what you've been working in. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, God of peace, who raised our Jesus from the dead, by your blood has secured for us an eternal forever salvation, a relationship that's unbreakable and given us now your guidance and provision. We're not sheep without a shepherd. Thank you, Lord. We have all that we need today. And so we ask that you would equip us Supply us with everything that is good, everything that we need to actually do your will. And God, because we know we're so dependent on you, we're not only asking you for the resources, we're begging you to do the work inside of us because our hearts are so prone to wonder, Lord. Prone to drift, prone to leave the God we love to think we can do this on our own. And so would you energize deep within our hearts, stir in us the desire to carry these things out. And the work ethic surge in us, there's this unstoppable energy to actually go out and put this into action, Lord. We pray all of this for the glory of your name, Jesus, so that Jesus is better is not just some catchphrase on a website, but it's deeply ingrained in our hearts. It's the cry of our souls. We've seen that you are our greatest treasure. We pray for your name alone, Jesus. Amen.